my name is Spider-Man. You can call me Webhead, you can call me Amazing, just don't call me late for dinner, you get it? <laughs> Following the critical and commercial success of The Amazing Spider-Man, Sony began work on a sequel. Listening to the criticisms for the first film, The Amazing Spider-Man 2 aimed to lighten the tone by revamping the aesthetic, style, and costumes to better fit this new energetic world. However, because Sony prioritized sequels over quality, The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was a critical disappointment upon release, thereby ending a a film franchise with enormous amounts of potential. From Green Goblin's original design to a Jeff Bezos inspired Electro, let's take a look at the many concepts and plot elements that were cut from The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Before we start, if you enjoy this video and wish to see more like it in the future, be sure to subscribe to the channel and give this video a thumbs up. Anyways, let's get started. Outfit. We have a caller on the line named Max. He says he knows Spider-Man. The original Spider-Man costume was not universally adored by the fans. Many were bothered by the yellow eyes, the muted color scheme, and the basketball-like texture. Observing the fans' contempt, the production team opted to redesign the suit to make it more visually appealing and approachable. This new Spider-Man suit was more vibrant, fashionable, and appeared like it came straight out of a comic book. There's almost nobody who genuinely dislikes this new suit. However, it took a long time to get to this final design. Originally, the production team was still focused on using the original suit. Since the Amazing Spider-Man existed in a grounded world, they were still focused on making the design practical. Many of the concepts stay close to Spider-Man's original outfit. The sharp triangular eyes remain, the red and blue patterns are nearly identical, and the colors have been muted and dolled out once again. Many of them, however, make minor changes to the design to make it more unique, such as widening the eyes to make them stand out more, playing with the web pattern on the chest, and making the eyes white, and even modifying the spider logo. However, it became clear at some point that the previous suit didn't match with the tone of the second film. It was clear now that the suit needed to be overhauled entirely. Some of the artists went all out with the reimaginings. Just like the production team did with the first film's designs, they experimented with the shape of the eyes, the suit's colors, and the design of the web pattern to make some of the most interesting character designs I've ever seen. In this concept, the artist clearly took slight inspiration from Miles Morales. I love many things about this costume, from the large reflective bug eyes, the raised crimson spider logo, and the thick webbing that is uniquely structured on the suit. The problem is that this suit is synonymous with Miles Morales, so it doesn't really fit with Peter Parker. If you like the design of this costume, but wish it had more traditional colors, you're in luck, because there's a nearly identical suit design. The suit appears metallic, the eyes are once again yellow, and the spider logo is blue, hearkening back to the design language of the first film. But once again, a suit like this wouldn't make sense for a poor person like Peter Parker. Eventually, the suit began to appear more like what we see in the final film. The colors are still muted, but the eyes are noticeably larger, and the spider logo is no longer fragmented, and the suit's belt is finally present. With a new costume also comes new web shooters. The web shooters in The Amazing Spider-Man is a large red device that appears sleek and advanced, and this design element is perfectly reflected in the concepts. The web shooters in these early drawings appear to be very advanced and futuristic. They resemble a device you'd find in a science fiction film, created using the most cutting edge technologies available. The artist appears to have wanted the web shooters to be aesthetically distinct and eye catching by adding an abundance of bright lights. Some of the concepts took the futuristic theme even farther. The web shooters in these designs have a pause and play button as if they were some kind of universal remote. 
Some even gave the web shooters a huge touchscreen in case Spider-Man wanted to text Gwen while swinging. These designs are interesting, but they appear to be far too pricey for Peter Parker to reasonably afford. Later web shooter concepts simplified the design to make it more practical and basic. In the comics, Electro is a man dressed in tight green spandex with lightning bolts shooting from his pants. He also dons a bizarre lightning bolt mask. Although this outfit is iconic, it also appears quite silly when translated into real life. By drawing inspiration from Ultimate Electro, the creators of The Amazing Spider-Man 2 wanted to ground Electro in reality and produce a sleek and modern design that didn't appear goofy. This concept was likely conceived before Jamie Foxx was cast in the role. Electro is still wearing the black bodysuit with lightning pulsing through his entire body. The lightning, however, is yellow rather than blue, demonstrating how the production team experimented with the original color scheme. Judging by his posture, Electro still believes himself to be a godly entity with enormous power. A god named Sparkles? Eventually, the artist settled on Electro's blue aesthetic, and judging from this concept, it seems like Electro's skin was supposed to appear translucent, allowing us to see his glowing skeleton underneath his electrified exterior. Electro's final appearance was not determined until Jamie Foxx was cast in the role. The only substantial differences between some of the concepts and what we see in the final film are slightly different variations of his black outfit. Surprisingly, according to this concept, Electro was not always glowing blue. His skin appears to return to normal when his powers are either dampened or when he isn't utilizing them at all. However, judging from the blue aura and his glowing veins, he can barely hold back the sheer amounts of energy flowing through his body. In the comics, the Green Goblin's costume isn't very complicated. It includes a bright green bodysuit with purple gloves, purple boots, a purple hat, and a terrifying goblin mask with a purple bag and a goblin glider to complement this iconic look. For whatever reason, it appears that adopting this design to the big screen is quite difficult for creatives. Therefore, many of them come up with novel and inventive ways to translate Goblin to the big screen. The Amazing Spider-Man films utilized a different strategy than the first Spider-Man films, which used the body armor as replacement for Goblin's unique costume. Goblin's design in TASM 2 is due to a genetic disease called retroviral hyperplasia, a condition that alters a person's appearance until they resemble a goblin. A greenish color spreads over the body like an uncontrollable rash, turning your skin green and repulsive. The disease also transforms your fingernails and teeth until they're long and sharp like a creature. The illness even eats away at your skin, causing your spine to reveal itself. The design we see in the film is pretty plain, and we barely witness the full death of Goblin's transformation. Dane DeHaan's Goblin appearance was originally considerably more striking than what we see in the finished film. According to this makeup test by Weta Digital, his skin is much greener, and his nose and ears are much larger and sharper. This truly showed the full extent of the Goblin disease, but for some reason, it got cut for something less fantastical. The creative team had two completely different approaches to Green Goblin's design. While some concepts are much tamer with the effects of the disease on Harry's appearance, many concepts fully embrace the Goblin's aesthetic. His face has completely turned green, his facial features and ears have been distorted, and his eyes have become overtaken by darkness with black veins visible around his eyes. It has become clear that Harry is no longer human and has truly become a Green Goblin. Just take a look at this concept, which goes all out with the monstrous appearance. Harry's facial features appear to be elongated as his facial bones 
have now become more prominent. With most of his hair gone now, there is no sign that this individual was once a human being. But Goblin isn't only defined by his appearance, but also by his gear. Since the Amazing Spider-Man existed in a grounded world, Goblin's gear is mostly prototype gear from Oscorp. Instead of fabric, he wears a metallic body armor that covers his whole body. The armor never looks simple and seems to have many moving parts that make the design very complicated and advanced. Many concepts also give the Goblin a mask that conceals his appearance. Some masks look simple and only cover a portion of his face. Other concepts completely conceal Goblin's ugly appearance. Unlike the Raimi films, which still gives Goblin a mask that looks unique, these mask designs look pretty plain and almost resemble a helmet that someone in a fighter jet would wear. Take a look at this concept. Once again, the mask conceals the entire face, but this time, the design is considerably more unique with a gigantic glass dome and an elongated back section that is supposed to mimic the silhouette of Goblin's purple hat. It seems like the artist tried to ground Goblin's mask in reality while still trying to stay true to his original look. However, in the end, the production team avoided using the mask entirely and instead gave the Goblin a microphone attached to a visor. When designing Goblin's glider, the production team wanted it to look bird-like in appearance. When flying through the air, it was sleek and compact, and when it came to a stop, the wings spread out like a bird. The glider also needed to look maneuverable, fast, and agile, but they also needed to appear tough and built for combat. Due to this, many concepts seem to embrace the glider's militaristic appearance while still having the silhouette of a bird. They look quite bulky and appear as if they were designed for intense combat and durability. While these heavy-duty versions of the glider are perfectly valid, they don't appear to be particularly agile, especially given their large bodies. Some glider designs minimize the heavy-duty appearance in favor of maneuverability and a bird-like awe. This glider concept is a perfect mix of both maneuverability and power. The glider's jet black appearance and sharp features makes it appear both aggressive and agile. The design looks less like a bird and more like a giant bat or even a raven. While some glider designs closely follow the traditional look, some artists still take some creative liberties with the design and create something new and distinct. In these concepts, the glider looks incredibly bulky. Judging from the art, this is a device that has two ways of writing it. Either the user sits down or moves it in a standing position. It's a strange and unorthodox approach to a glider design, but it looks way too bulky to be reasonably considered. In these concepts, the goblin looks like he's having the time of his life. Unlike the past glider designs, these ones are by far the sleekest and most compact. They look like they prioritize speed and agility over everything else. To this end, they don't appear to have the firepower of previous gliders. They look like tools that would be used for fast-paced sports and not something you'd take into combat. The rhino in the comics is typically a buff man who is fused with a piece of armor. This costume is typically made out of an indestructible polymer that is intentionally modeled after a rhino. Other versions of the character still make him incredibly tall and muscular, but they do change the material of the suit to something more metallic and cybernetic. When it comes to Rhino's design, the creators of The Amazing Spider-Man chose the latter path. Many of the concepts illustrated the Rhino as a man who's wearing a metallic Rhino costume that's built for durability in combat. They often look intimidating and don't stray too far from his comic appearance. However, while comic versions keep the design simple, the production team 
opted to have the rhino look a bit more advanced. The suit is often made to look more stylized and modern, and some artists take some interesting creative liberties with the suit that serve to make the rhino look a bit more unique. In this concept, the rhino looks like a gorilla for some reason, as none of its features even remotely resemble a rhino. This concept doesn't even give the rhino his suit of armor. Instead, he's given a green exoskeleton with goggles and a rhino forehead. I am not entirely sure what the thought process was behind this design because it just does not work. Not entirely sure when and why, but eventually, the production team abandoned the rhino's traditional body armor in favor of something completely different. Instead of embracing rhino's traditional look, the artist decided to make the rhino's costume a gigantic robotic suit similar to a mech. Seriously, rhino looked like he came straight out of a Gundam series. His suit looks overly complicated with many moving parts. The suit is always in a variety of different shapes, never running out of new and unique designs. The suit also has a cockpit that the driver pilots the mech from, allowing him to control every bit of its movement. All versions of the suit allow for two forms of movement. The first is its upright mode, which allows the suit to move around on its two hind legs like a human. The second mode transforms it into a rhino. It suddenly gets on all fours and is now ready to charge at you at full force. It's an interesting approach to rhino's design. However, many may say that it overcomplicates a simple design that's been around for decades. I'm all for redesigning iconic characters, but sometimes the changes are too great to be worth it. Sony was very obsessed with having Spider-Man face off against the Sinister Six. Not only were they set to be the antagonists of The Amazing Spider-Man 3, but they were also set to appear in their very own ensemble film. Once again, Sony didn't want to stay faithful to the characters' original looks. Instead, they opted to find practical and grounded explanations for these characters' powers and gear. As a result, Many of the villain's gear and abilities were explained using prototype military technologies. In this concept of the Scorpion, the suit was reimagined to be an anti-projectile defense system that was built to take on approaching projectiles, similar to how an Iron Dome intercepts incoming enemy rockets. This Scorpion suit was built to destroy incoming projectiles before they reached their target. However, unlike an Iron Dome that intercepts targets with missiles, this suit used a high-powered blue laser that was attached to a large tail. However, due to the tough-looking armor and the plethora of other design features, such as the claws and small tentacles, I believe that this suit was meant to be used for disarming dangerous explosives. The suit most likely increases the durability and strength of its wearer. This would explain how the Scorpion could reasonably take on Spider-Man in a fight. Uh -oh. The creative team also tried to find a way to explain the Sandman's powers. This machine shown in the concepts is a device that is built for the military. Through the process of molecular manipulation, this device would create shields using the environment as a catalyst, and in this specific case, most shields were created using sand. This device was made for desert warfare, and it seemed like the artist experimented with many ways the device would be transported. However, due to some kind of severe malfunction, the device would somehow bond a human and sand together, leading to the creation of the Sandman. In these concepts, it appears as if the Vulture's suit was created for aerial combat. 
you can see how the wings are incredibly sharp and the gauntlets are packed full of different weapons. According to the artists, the wings were designed to be hand-like structures. It allows the user to change its shape and angles very fast and accurately. It's very similar to how a bat flies through the air, as because their hands are wings, they're incredibly agile, fast and maneuverable. This vulture design is one of the very few suit concepts that did make it into the final film, as it can be seen near the end of the film and briefly it's shown in the post credit scene. The designers also created concepts for Doc Ox tentacles. Judging from the art, it seems like the tentacles were used for scientific purposes, such as handling dangerous materials and elements. The device is very large, however, there's a chance that this device was only a prototype that was still being developed. You may notice that the claws are not present and are instead tendrils akin to an octopus. This design for the arms is indeed unique, but unfortunately, they didn't make it into the final film. The actual design we see in the film is much different and much smaller and has a slightly different design. The tentacles also have claws this time around. This concept showcases the Venom symbiote being contained inside a hypersonic device. Before the cancellation of The Amazing Spider-Man 3, Venom could have potentially appeared as one of the antagonists of the film. The Tom Hardy Venom movie is a refurbished version of the original Venom film that was meant to be a spin-off set in the Amazing Spider-Man cinematic universe. Mark Webb has expressed interest in seeing Venom appear, but unfortunately, this concept is the closest we'll ever see Venom in the Amazing Spider-Man universe. Actress Shailene Woodley originally played Mary Jane Watson in the film. Her role in the film was not very long, only really having four or fewer minutes of screen time in the entire film. In the end, her role was completely omitted from the story for two major reasons. One, the creative team and the cast felt like the story needed to focus on the relationship between Peter and Gwen Stacy. Having MJ appear felt unnecessary and only served to overcomplicate Peter's love life. The second reason was that the film already had too many characters. Introducing another side plot with Mary Jane would only make the film more cluttered than it needed to be. Take a look at this concept that appears to show Spider-Man hanging a man from the ceiling. This person is Mary Jane's abusive father. You see, originally, there was supposed to be a small side plot in which Mary Jane and her father had just recently moved next door to Peter's house. Peter, Gwen, and Aunt May would run into them a couple of times, but eventually, they would begin to realize that her father was a drunk who treated their daughter very badly. This would eventually lead to this scene taking place, where Spider-Man would essentially threaten the man to treat his daughter more nicely. I think it was the right call to cut the scene from the film. Although I'm sure it would have been well executed, this sequence only serves to add fluff that is not needed. MJ was not completely cut from the film, as you can briefly see her back during the Rhino's Rampage. A very insignificant scene for one of Spider-Man's most iconic characters. It's sad that most of these concepts never made it into the final film. However, it's always great to look back at the unused ideas and see the many directions this film could have went.